morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church because First Presbyterian Church is wherever the people of First Presbyterian are worshiping. Uh, this morning is a communion Sunday, so if you haven't yet brought your elements to whatever your worship space is this morning, then go ahead and grab those, whatever they happen to and juice. Uh, we seek to be a church uh, where every member is sharing in the ministry of God. Each and every person has been created with love and with purpose by our creating God. And each and every person has gifts to share. So if you feel called to be a part of this church, please reach out and share whatever gifts you have for the glory of God. This ministry is not just about a couple people, but it's about the entire entire body of Christ, flourishing and service and life together. And with that, I'd like to invite Dave Garner to unmute himself and to, uh, to share the minute for mission this morning. Okay. Very good. Good morning, everyone. It's that time of year when it's time to talk about stewardship campaign. And what a year this has been so far, and it's not even over yet. Even though we are holding church services in the virtual world, our real world church is still there. Our real world expenses are very much with us. Expenses like personnel, utilities, maintenance still need to be paid. Also, in addition to the usual expenses, the real world church building is in need of major roof repairs to the tune of 150,000, Stained glass windows need repairs to the tune of between 90 and 120,000. So these are still with us. The, unlike last year, we picked up our packets at the in the church. This year, we will be the packets have been mailed out to you starting last week. So when you receive your packet of information and pledge cards please fill them out and return them as soon as possible so that we can begin to plan for the coming year to continue our church's mission in our community. Also at this time, I'd like to really thank my committee, Kathy Waters, Marsha McCormick, Linda Andrews, Jeannie Stearman, and Tom Stites for all their hard work and their creativity. They made the chair's job look easy. Thank you all. And now, friends, I'd like to invite you to join with me in our call to worship that's found in our bulletin. We gather from the west to the east, from the south to the north, to celebrate the God of peace who accompanies us in our acts of peace. This God of peace accompanies us in each and every circumstance around us. We praise God's name. Amen. And on this World Communion Sunday, our opening prayer includes translations both from English and from the Shona languages. So let's come before God in the spirit of prayer. Mwari Wedu, our God who is. Musiki Wedu, our creator God. Nyadenga Wedu, our heavenly father. Bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. Bless us with an anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people. Bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war. Bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world. Muziti Rababa, Nere Mwanakomana, Nere Mweye Mutvene, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please join with me in singing, When Israel Was in Egypt's Land, our first hymn. <laughs>
confess our sins. Creator God, master of all that our earth produces, from the humble sheep of wheat, after we are grocery shopping, we are always amazed at the variety of food available to us from all over the world and for the diverse range of colors, sizes that are all your design. You created it all for us to enjoy, to savor, to feed on and share with each other over meal tables, in homes and on patios at the seashore and on mountaintops. Forgive us when we rush our meal times, when we forget to stop and savor our food and those at the table with us. Forgive us for our part in overstretching the earth's natural resources and for failing to ensure that it is shared equally. Help us to embrace our meal times, to share them with others, to savor and enjoy them to remember special times with those who have gone before us. May we open our tables to others and share food and fellowship with friend and stranger. May we open our hearts to remember you in bread and wine and to be remembered body, mind, and spirit as part of the body of Christ here and now. So be it. Amen. <clears throat> God accepted us simply because of our faith in Christ through whom our sins were forgiven. May Jesus help us to continue to preach peace to those who are near and far. Amen. I'm here so that the camera can get you and the sound at the same time. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, grant us openness and give us understanding of what each of us needs to receive through Holy Scripture. Keep going. When we are facing a difficult choice between the easy and the right decision, help us to choose the narrow path. We also no. pray for all who are about to set on an adventurous journey of faith anywhere in the world. Amen. Good. Keep going. Reading from the Gospels. Luke 22, uh, verse 7 and 14 through 20. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to thank Barb for stepping in at the last minute. We're kind of figuring out the technology as we go. So I have had the honor this week of presiding over uh, two funerals, one that just happened, another that's about to happen. Uh, two funerals of strong, loving women who were in their 90s. And as I've been preparing these services and hearing stories of their lives, their story, I have been marveling at how much we can experience over the course of one lifetime. There are so many ways that God shows up through the course of our story. There are so many experiences that we face over the course of one lifetime that have the potential to teach us and transform us into the shalom people that God created us to be. As I think of all these ancestors who have gone before us, I am in awe of these saints who have weathered storms, weathered times of poverty or oppression, and weathered societal change. 
And I marvel at how God can teach a person how to live faithfully through whatever circumstances they're living through. And as I've been sitting in our scripture story for this morning, I've been wondering, how do we carry on God's ongoing story from generation to generation? How can we learn from the past so that we don't have to repeat the suffering and injustice that others have already experienced? As I watch the news these days, I wonder at how easy it is to forget our story, to forget those who have gone before us and to just look at the past with a rose-colored mythology without holding on to those hard-earned lessons of the saints who have gone before us. Mercy, it wasn't that long ago that the world was devastated by a world holocaust at the hands of Nazis and white supremacy, and we still haven't seemed to learn the lesson that Nazis and white supremacy are evil. If we're not intentional about holding on to our story, we can forget all these key lessons that God has revealed along the way. If we forget our story of God and with God, we can get swayed to believe other less loving narratives that advocate instead for greed and depression and discrimination. As human beings, we are storied people. The stories that we tell shape how we see ourselves and our connection with the larger world. Whether we are grounded in reality or moved by mythology, our stories have the ability to give our lives meaning and purpose, hope and history. Our stories have the ability to allow us to look backward and forward and to allow us to redefine our present reality. So church, how can we hold on to the story of God, of how God has been with us, teaching us, and growing us along the way? How can we remember the story of God's redemption throughout time so that we ourselves can live into these lessons and become the embodiment of who God is in our world? Well, this is what our story from scripture is about today. But first, let's take a step back and look at what has led up to the story. Last week, we heard the story of how Joseph was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, but how God had used that terrible experience for good and for the saving of many lives. And from there, the Israelites settled into the land of Egypt, and they lived there peaceably for many generations. All until one day when a new pharaoh rose over Egypt. And this pharaoh did not remember their ancestor Joseph or his story, but he instead chose to weave a new story, a story of fear and threat. The pharaoh told the Egyptian people that the Israelite minority was dangerous. The Israelites were something other. They were basically animals. Their lives didn't matter as much as the true Egyptians. And once he got going with this rhetoric, the Pharaoh developed policies within Egypt that scapegoated the Israelites. He oppressed them in enslavement and hard labor, and then he required the Egyptians to kill the baby Israelite boys by throwing them into the Nile. Think of how easily we can get talked into accepting a story like that. Imagine what it would take for you to accept the story of fear and superiority and nationalism. Imagine how someone can become convinced over time that it's normal and okay to allow another group to be treated as less worthy of life. And also consider how the ones being oppressed can start to believe this is the story that they have to live with now. Of course, there were some acts of resistance in this narrative of oppression. There were some who held courageously to the story of life, like the women who stood against evil and saved the baby Moses. But at the opening of the book of Exodus, the overall story that the Israelites seem to believe is that the Egyptians have become their masters and that this oppression is their story now. Imagine that this is what you have come to believe about yourself and your neighbors. 
But God, God is always weaving the story back to its original story, the story of Shalom. And God is not about to leave God's story in that mess of oppression. Moses, that child saved out of resistance, grew up after an altercation that ended with him killing an Egyptian taskmaster. Excuse me. Moses fled into the desert where he married, and he looked after the flocks of his father-in-law. It was there in the desert that God met Moses in a bush that was aflame and yet not burned up. And it was there that God called Moses to trust in God's story and what Yahweh God was going to do for the people. Yahweh called Moses to go back to Egypt and to set the people free. And as risky and unasked for as that calling was, Moses chose to do as God had instructed. Moses met up with his brother Aaron, returned to Egypt, and there he announced the good news of God's plan. And with that news, the people start to believe that deliverance might just be possible. And they bowed down and they worshipped. The Pharaoh, however, wasn't about to cede God's story of redemption as willingly as the Hebrew people embraced it. In accordance with Egyptian law, Moses and Aaron requested that the people have three days in the wilderness to worship their God. But Pharaoh refused. Pharaoh saw this as a ploy to help his slave labor force escape. And he wanted to squash this glimmer of hope within the Hebrew people. And so as a countermeasure, he increased their workload, leaving the people too exhausted to rebel or run away. The Hebrew people grew in their distress, and they took out their anxiety on Moses and Aaron, and Moses in turn took out his anxiety on God. But God knew how the story was going to play out. So God responded, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. There's this tension in our story between the ongoing story of shalom wholeness that God intends for the world and the stories that people tell to maintain fear and violence and injustice. There's a terrible tension in this narrative between God saying that God hears the cries of the oppressed and that their lives matter to God, contrasted with the messages that Pharaoh, that force of death, tells that we should just look the other way and allow violence and evil to win. But this God that we follow isn't about to give up on the divine story of restoration and wholeness. Even when Pharaoh believed that he was more powerful than the God who sees the oppressed. Even when Pharaoh built an economy on the backs of an enslaved people. Even when Pharaoh and the Egyptians lived into a story of Egyptians first scapegoating the minority and gaining treasure at the expense of others. Even when the Egyptians have grown numb to the cries of their fellow human beings. Even when Pharaoh ignores the initial plagues of God and insists that the Hebrew people will stay oppressed as his country's slaves. Even so, God isn't about to give up on God's story of restoration and wholeness. But which story will the people of God choose? The story we choose to live into matters. The future of the Israelites hinge on which story they will believe. If they believe the Pharaoh's story that they are simply slaves and oppressed people who need to accept this injustice, then they won't be able to trust in God's promises, and their hopelessness could keep them stuck in chains. On the other hand, if they remember and reorient themselves to this living story that their God is faithful and powerful enough to liberate them from oppression, then the Hebrew people will be able to risk that vulnerability that comes with breaking free and living into faith. So let's open up our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, starting at verse 1. We pick up our story in between the ninth and 10th plagues on the eve of the Israelites' escape from Egypt. Our story and God's story continue with these words. 
the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, and then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And then moving over to chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is first to open the womb among the Israelites of the human beings and of the animals is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by the strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib you are going out. When the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leaven shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. You shall tell your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It shall serve for you as a sign on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead, so that the teaching of the Lord may be on your lips. For with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a story-changing event. The God who watches over slaves is about to free them from oppression and lead them to the promised land. In the New Testament, the major event of our Christian faith that we commemorate is Jesus' resurrection at Easter. But in the Hebrew Testament, this story of the Passover before the Israelites' exodus is the major event that the Israelites were instructed to remember and live their lives around. God will later describe God's self by reminding them of what God did for them at this event. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's a powerful redirection of the story of who God is and how God is moving in the world. No matter what the Pharaoh might be saying, God hears the cries of the suffering, comes close and works powerfully and relentlessly to deliver the oppressed from a life of violence to a life of freedom and relationship and divine purpose. God knows that in order for the people to live as a whole and holy people into the future, they will need to remember this story. So Yahweh gives the people a ritual to engage in, a ritual to help them remember the power and faithfulness of God in the generations to come. They were called to participate in God's deliverance at the Passover through picking out and sacrificing the lamb. 
Then they were engaged in the story by making and eating this meal of roasted lamb, bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast, for there was no time to let it rise. After all those years of seeing themselves as slaves, the people are learning to identify again as God's people. And through these hands-on rituals, they were relearning to trust God in an embodied way. It's worth noting that God gives the Israelites this ritual of reenacting and remembering God's deliverance before they have even left Egypt. God didn't rescue Israel from Egypt and then command them to eat a meal to celebrate. God called them to eat the meal while they were still in bondage, before they were set free, and while God was still working out their salvation. They were called to remember this story of deliverance through this ritual. At chapter 12, verse 13, Yahweh God tells the people to put blood, that symbol of life, on doorposts and the lintels of their house. And God tells them the blood will be a sign for you. The ritual and the visual of the blood is not about God's need to figure out which are the Israelites' houses. The ritual helps the Israelites to recognize and experience their story in a new way. And with that, God commanded that this ritual of remembering wouldn't just end with them, but that they would include the future generations in the story as well. So generation after generation has been taught to practice the Passover ritual each year, sharing their story of God's deliverance through this embodied experience of cooking and eating and remembering in community. As we continue to explore the greater story of the Bible in the months ahead, we will get to see why reenacting and remembering this story was so important for their well-being. Well, in Egypt, the Israelite slaves needed to remember that God was for them and that God would rescue them from their suffering. But it's going to be just as important for them to remember their story of God delivering them after they've been liberated from slavery. Slavery. When they get out into the wilderness, they start to forget what life was like in Egypt. They start grumbling that they would prefer to be back in slavery rather than God's freedom. And so commemorating the Passover story becomes an antidote to nostalgia, to wanting to go back to a rose-colored idea of what we had rather than the life of growth and freedom that God wants for us. And the Israelites... Would, when, and as the Israelites would establish themselves in the land of Canaan, the act of remembering the Passover would become an antidote to arrogance and cruelty. Throughout the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible, the Israelites are told, remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall treat the marginalized with compassion. When things are going well for us and we think that we're in control of our lives, it can become so easy to fall into the belief that we are our own deliverers. It can be so easy to fall into a life of religiosity instead of actual dependence on God. And it can be so easy to feel superior over or smarter than those people who are struggling and need help. But when we pause to participate in remembering where we came from and how God was the one who delivered us repeatedly over the course of our story, we learn empathy for others who are experiencing suffering and justice, injustice. Many, many generations by Jesus of Nazareth continued to commemorate this Passover meal that was passed on to his generation from the ancestors. And in our gospel reading this morning, we heard how Jesus told his disciples when he shared that Passover meal with them. We heard how he broke the bread and shared it with his disciples, and he used those words, this is my body, which is given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And then as the story goes, Jesus takes the cup And he says, this cup is the new covenant by my blood, which is poured out for you. 
we remember God's part in our story each time that we celebrate the sacrament of communion. We don't just retell it, but we join in the story and we take it on as a part of our own identity. It is a meal that is rooted in God's act of deliverance. Through participating in this story, we identify as those who were in bondage. And we acknowledge that we are not the active agents of our own deliverance. Through remembering our story, we align ourselves with the God who is, and we risk ourselves to once again live into the story of what God is doing in our world around us. So church, breathe in the spirit of God and remember this great story. Draw to mind what the story of the Passover teaches us about who God is and what God wants for the oppressed and the suffering. And if that is who God is, what can we learn, what can we hold on to for our own generation about what it means to follow God? How can we remember and embody this story in our own lives today and wherever God leads us? Church, may we embody God's story of liberation. May our lives proclaim that we follow the God who hears the cries of the oppressed, moves in close and stops at nothing to restore them to wholeness. May future generations know God through our witness. May it be so. Amen.
Our generous God provides for all our needs. We are rich beyond compare, not always in money, but still we are rich in all that God has given us. We offer our gifts of money today, knowing that they are only a smart, small part of what we offer. Our whole being, our whole energy, our passion, our desire for the kingdom. May God accept these offerings and take them and use them in the world. Friends, if you need information for how you can share your gifts, uh, there's more information at the end of the bulletin. And with that, we return now to this table. The sacrament of communion is rooted in our story of God delivering the oppressed from bondage. Through joining together in this meal, we reenact our story, the story of our, the, our Hebrew ancestors preparing to live into God's deliverance. And we reenact our story of Jesus sharing this Passover meal with his disciples. As we come together for this ritual of remembrance, let us remember our story of how we were once slaves. Let us remember that we are not the active agents of our own deliverance. Let us live into the story of faithfulness, of trying to follow God out of injustice and violence and into liberation and restoration. Friends, let us join in the spirit of prayer. From every place on this planet, we turn our face to you, O God. Gather us, all of your people, together to pray. In the midst of forces which would separate us, bind us in your love as the church, together. Strengthen us through the grace of your people gathered, no matter how we gather with the truth of your presence. In a world that is aching to be made new, we cry out with those who suffer the pains of what powers and principalities extract from the world's poorest. We cry out with those who suffer from illness and disease, at whom the world turns a callous glance. We cry out with those stinging from the sins of white supremacy. We cry out with those seeking justice, equality, and peace. Peace at all times and in all ways in a world stretching toward wholeness. We celebrate with those whose lives bear the fruit of the Spirit and seek to share in your call to partnership. We celebrate with those who celebrate with all who gather to earnestly seek your transforming work in the world. Make us a world that grows into the shape of your communion table where all are welcomed and fed. Make us a people who grow your family by practices of mutuality, generosity, and justice. And may we live into your story of deliverance, living as a community who embodies your own love and justice, a people who belong to you, O oh God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and we join our voices together from wherever they are to pray that the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We give thanks for this bread, fruit of the earth and hard work, a gift of grace and a gift of God. We break it and we share it, remembering the words and the actions, the gestures and the glances, silences and the self-offered life of the teacher from Nazareth. And we give thanks for the fruits of the vine, for the joy of communion, for the alliances that endure in the search for justice and wholeness. We take this cup and we know that we are a part of the community, people renewing its covenant with life. Friends, as always, this is, this is the Lord's table. 
It isn't First Presbyterian's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's not a table just for people who look like us or come from our background. This is the Lord's table. And our Savior invites all who seek to trust in him to share in this meal that he has provided. Church, in our many places, let us join in this meal as the body of Christ. renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to faithfully live into your story of freedom in mercy wherever we go. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Church, may your week be one of blessing, where your hearts are full, your mind at rest, and your soul stirred to action. May you find God, the Creator, guiding you, Jesus, the Messiah, walking with you, and the Holy Spirit inspiring your days. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>